So did you have anything else? I, I think we maybe go to Q and A at this stage. Yeah. So uh, if we want to do Q and A, uh, I'm trying to think of an easy way. We could just do hands. That's probably just the easiest way. We'll just go with the chaos. Uh, apologies if I overlook you because I will ask a question and forget who I was going to call next. But right here, I had the first hand up. All right. Um, so how do you balance modeling, uh, modeling the reality, and creating a game with certain subjects to be examined? Um, for instance, in the original edition, it sounded like various uh, diff different strengths for men and women, right? Which is a statistical factor that you might model if you're modeling reality. Now is something that we don't examine. But elf height versus human height is. So and, and it seems like the point of that is to frame the conversation. Like, that's you can be whatever you want, but then look at the difference in these fan uh, fantasy races. Yeah. Oh, sorry, was yeah. there more? And, yeah. and the other thing was, um, it seems to me that a role-playing game provides a really interesting opportunity to challenge something like that, challenge being a different gender. Um, you, you can play it out. And, and it used to be done more metaphorically. You might be a half-elf if you want to face, you know, not belonging to either two worlds, being a mixed race or something. It might challenge it metaphorically. But today, you can challenge it. Like, you can it literally, it seems like it's, we're being encouraged to challenge it literally. And we think that's a fair thing. Yeah. Um, well, one, one reason why we don't dwell on uh, gender difference when it comes to game statistics yeah. is uh, heroes in particular in fantasy stories are outliers. They're exceptional. So even if we try to model um, you know, some, some, some difference that might exist in male and female physiology in the real world, the point is our characters are unlikely to follow those norms. Uh, because we, we are talking about people who slay dragons. Uh, we're talking about people who learn spells that open doors to other dimensions. Uh, and so it's really not in our interest when it comes to creating this sort of fantasy environment um, to go down that road. Uh, particularly because not only in our game, but really in the game's mythological roots, that sort of uh, exceptional quality to the characters is really the norm. Um, I mean, it's, it's easy to forget that, like, in the Irish, we were talking about this earlier today, in the Irish myth tradition, uh, Cuculain of Nerthenne, which is one of the greatest warriors of Irish mythology, and is actually one of the inspirations for the d and uh, barbarian, because Cuculain, when he would fly into a rage, would transform and become super powerful. Um, it was called his warp frenzy. Uh, and so that's actually directly influenced our game design. Well, who was he trained by? He was trained by a woman named Scothuk in Scotland who was thought to be the greatest warrior in the world. Uh, so like, he might be the guy who gets featured, but he had to go to her, the master badass, to learn how to be a number two badass. And, and really, in a way, he, in some ways, he was so strong not because he was any better at warfare than she was, it was because he had his magical war frenzy. Um, so, so again, it's, it's because again, in the myth tradition, and in fantasy, heroes are exceptional. Right. And then the second part is the opportunity, um, whether people should be challenging things metaphorically or literally now. It seems like they're being encouraged to maybe uh, try being, would you suggest that they attempt facing gender discrimination in a role-playing game, or is it just there to let you represent um, that, I mean, that's really up to each storyteller. Um, yeah. I mean, Especially with D and D, oh, did my mic out? Okay. We'll just stand here quietly, back to If 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 somebody wants, uh, you know, in their storytelling to explore any form of discrimination, that could certainly create a powerful story. Uh, but it isn't something we would want to embed in the heart of our game, particularly because we are providing a platform for other people's storytelling, and that would be a pretty heavy thing for us to lay on people, to say basically every D&D game has to grapple with discrimination. Uh, far easier... Far easier, thank you. Far easier for us to have a norm that is uh, widely inclusive, and then it's up to individual players how they want to deal with that threat. Um, now, 
that metaphorical exploration, and I'm really glad that that's on your radar, because that is actually one of the really powerful things about fantasy, um, that's something we still expect people to do. Uh, we don't, we, we definitely don't, especially as sort of the premier fantasy game, don't want to lose our roots there, um, because you know, part of the power of the dwarf and the elf is they are metaphors for extremes of human behavior. Uh, you know, dwarves are a metaphor for often greedy, industrious stubbornness. Uh, you know, and, and elves are are often a, a metaphor for beautiful, long-lived aloofness uh, that is simultaneously alluring and unreachable. Um, we don't want to lose that. That's powerful. It's a powerful metaphor. Uh, and so really what we're doing with, the, with our humans is rather than having them eclipse those metaphors, we're having the human properly take its place beside them. Because we, we really drive home in the player's handbook that what sets the human being apart from all of these other races, the quality the human has that they do not have, is diversity. Uh, the human being is the most diverse of, of all of our species. Now, that said, our other species do also have differences in skin tone, different subcultures. You know, we have dark-skinned dwarves, we have fair-skinned dwarves, but none of our other species has as large a range of body types, of skin colors, of cultural differences. That's what's special about being a human being. Let's get a question right back here. Yeah, right. Uh, so I've read through the player's handbook a couple of times already, and uh, Seeing the text in there, it's it's definitely noticeable that you're trying to be more inclusive with this, but do you think that uh, the text that you've included is enough to get people to really identify that they might, uh, to see if they want to try out uh, experimenting with some of those new options? I, my, my guess is, we, we haven't collected data on this yet, but my guess simply monitoring uh, online reaction as well as reaction of people at conventions is that the text is already having an effect. That simply its presence, people are like, oh, I've never thought about that. Um, now, I think initially it's, it's mostly been sort of a grace note um, for people where it's like, ooh, this game has a place for me. But I wouldn't be surprised if over time it led to people playing more and more diverse characters. Yeah, and I think it's something that'll show up too, like uh, as we go forward and we do more adventures and more storytelling, and then having more characters, a more diverse cast, uh, I think that that'll actually help draw some of that out. Uh, because I think really at this stage for the player's handbook, since it's more of a rules manual, I think like, like Jeremy described, we don't want to be too, we, we don't want to go over the top with it, we just want to be very factual about it. Like here is something you could do as opposed to, say, creating an adventure or a setting where there are characters prominently featured who are, you know, depending on, you know, uh, gender identity, sexuality, and so forth, where they're more, where they're, you know, where there's more difference there. Any other questions? Or, oh, right here. Um, yeah, so I was looking at the art, and it's actually really impressed me so far. Um, Thank you. Where it, uh, it's like, um, compared to other D&D books, they've also had impressive art, but um, some of these, like, Continually, um, uh, very uh, unique and interesting. Uh, specifically, the last two images, like the one before this one and this one, I've really liked. Like the one before me, really reminds me that that, that, that really reminds me of the movie Joan of Arc. And the last one uh, really makes me think of like Solomon, uh, Solomon's Temple, and uh, that makes me think. So, what about uh, also religious diversity? Is that something that you're looking on, uh, like? Um, talking about and how religion has worked in the past. In, in terms of like real world religion or? Uh, both, influences in fantasy it, as well as other things. It, it's very tricky. So my, when it comes to religion, uh, I'll speak just for myself. Since we are dealing with a fantasy world and we're also talking about, I mean, there's already something about you're taking like things from the world and, and making them mechanical. Uh, I'd be very leery about taking real world beliefs and trying to translate them. Because there is always that, like you're just you're gonna get it wrong. You're gonna do something and. Yeah, we're, we're, there we're looking more for. A, a, it's more driven by like a, 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 I, I I'm gonna use the word like a surface impression of it, rather than say the real depth of the symbology behind it is necessary. We're looking for. 
because we do want to avoid, uh, we, we, we don't want to offend anybody. Yeah. Because obviously when you talk about someone's beliefs, something very core to them. So it's really about us trying to be mindful and trying to be thinking, well, where is the line drawn? So for the characters, it's more things of looking at different like religious practices, cultures, really driving that more culturally. Uh, so if you see a culture that's dominated by one religion over, over another, or, or, or another, you might see those coming through in the costume. But I think in general, we try to avoid it because we are, that is just one area where, because it's a fantasy game, there's always the sensitivity of, well, we don't want to kind of tell, hey, uh, your religion is actually a fantasy, right? That's just not a message we ever want to give to somebody. So, I mean, does that kind of square with? I mean, it, and, and while we, we definitely don't embed any of our world's uh, religions in our game, um, our game is certainly influenced by them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and so we do use versions of symbols for resonance, uh, because a big part of fantasy um, versus science fiction and, and some other uh, speculative genres is fantasy must be recognizable. Yeah. That's, that's part of the power of fantasy, is always that feeling of, I've never seen this before, but I feel like I did long ago. Uh, you know, fantasy sort of taps into cultural archetypes, things that are very ancient, and so because of that, it, in a way, it, it, it's impossible for us to avoid at least playing a little bit with elements uh, of, from real world religious traditions. But mostly what we're exploring in our worlds is ancient polytheism, because all official D&D worlds are polytheistic. And also, in our, and this is something we talk, we have to remind our writers often, because our writers will come and assume uh, a lot of sort of real world uh, religious phenomena, and we have to remind them, well, faith means something different in a world where you know the gods exist. Because like you're in fact walking with a guy who gets spells every morning from a god. And so in a way, faith in that setting isn't a particularly meaningful concept. It, it also, and, and this is where for a moment I get to put on my hat, because part of my academic, <laughs> my, my other, my past, I actually have a master's degree in religious studies. Um, and part of it also is a lot of people don't realize that faith is a fairly modern concept. In the ancient world, uh, it's about practice uh, and about it's what you do to serve a god. So sacrifice, offerings, building shrines and temples to glorify a particular god. Um, in fact, I just the other day had to prepare a note from one of our writers where there was talk in our Forgotten Realm setting of clerics converting people. And my question is, converting to what? Uh, because in a polytheistic setting, where you know the gods exist and there are no modern style creeds, conversion is not a particularly meaningful concept. Now, you might encourage somebody to join in the service of a particular god, but that character probably also occasionally gives honor to one of the other <coughs> gods. Uh, the way it was, say, in ancient Greece, where in the morning you might give an offering to Aphrodite, uh, and then uh, in the evening you might whisper a prayer to Zeus. Yeah, and I just want to throw in one more thing. And we talked about with the, that approach with religious imagery. It also applied to how we approach the cultures. We didn't want to just take a real world culture and just whole hog, just say this is exactly what we wanted to do for very similar reasons. We didn't want to say, oh, like, you know, ancient Ethiopia is actually, it's a fantasy world and all this other stuff. We wanted to more take multiple influences and, and merge them into something that was, like Jeremy said, resonant and familiar, but also it was something that was unique.